Hello everyone, this is Bruce Walton from the Chronicle Telegram. We are about to start a live feed of the Lorraine City Schools Academic Distress Committee meeting uh, that is happening at the Lorraine High School. Uh, we have many parents, uh, teachers, uh, probably one of the most filled meetings that is going on right now. Um, it is expected to start around five. It should be in a few minutes now. Today's meeting is happening just on the cusp of the discussion of the suspension of the requirement for teachers to reapply for their positions in the district. Uh, just this afternoon, district CEO David Hardy had suspended that requirement, which was discussed last week. Thank you. 
I'd like to call this meeting to order, please. Thank you all. Let's start with the roll call. Mr. Ballard? Here. Mr. Demacchia? Yes. Ms. Johnson? Mr. Sturgill? Here. Mr. Williams? Here. Pledge of Allegiance, please. All right. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation. I want to welcome you all here today. This is a, quite a crowd, and uh, I wish it was like this at every meeting, and um, it should be going into the future. So starting off first, we would like to recognize our visitors. We've got Ms. Diane Zander from the ADC off to our left, Mr. Cawthon from the ADC. we got Chief Sel Rivera, the mayor of Lorraine, Mr. Chase Rittenauer, we got? We got Mr. Tony Giardini, our legal, and Mallory, I forget your last name, Santiago from our law department. So all are welcome. So we're going to start recognizing our visitors right from the beginning. And with that, we're going to turn it over to the mayor to introduce uh, the ADC. And if you'd have some opening remarks, and if not, we can go right to Diane. Well, thank you, everybody. You know, uh, let, let me interrupt yeah. you real quick. Let me introduce our robotics yeah, kids. So let me stop that. This can be a little while. <laughs> How about we have the most awesome, awesome. So we've got Miss Denise Farron. Please to the microphone and introduce who you got with you and tell us all the great things that our students are doing, please. Being, uh, I thought everybody came out for a recognition. Of, uh, <laughs> they're like, oh, is this interview? I said, make sure it's the biggest interview you have. <laughs> so they're all excited. And we're here. This is the Longfellow Robotics team. And as you can see in front of you, we have three different robots, so three different teams. And we're going to introduce each team at a time. They're going to introduce <coughs> who they are. Go ahead. And then I'm going to also introduce our coaches. So first team we have is Cronus. Come on up, gentlemen. I'm Shane H. I work on building the book and sometimes I help with programming. I'm Logan. This is my first year it's on the team. I program, build, and drive. And some awards that we have won this year are the Create Award, the Innovate Award, the, D the Sportsmanship Award, and two tournament championships. Outstanding. Okay, gentlemen. All right, Team Titanius. Take my 
Hi, my name is Andy. I am, this is my second year. I am in eighth grade. My job of the robotics team is to drive, do some programming, and to build. Hi, my name is Jack. This is my first year, and I'm a sixth grade. What I do is building and the parts list of the engineering notebook. My name is Jonathan. This is my first year and I help with the building, and I also do some of the programming. Hi, my name is Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> 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 my name is Madison. I do the building, um, and I do the engineering notebook. Um, and some of the awards that we've won this season are, we have two times judges <coughs> award, two times excellence award, um, build and design award. Julian Rivera. I am in seventh grade. This is my first year of robotics, and I work on the engineering notebook, which helps document the robot. Uh, some awards that I know that we won is the Excellence Award and the Design Award. Uh, competition is called Turning Point. As you can see, the caps that are down there, they have to flip the caps to a different color. They have to be able to shoot flags. So they have to design robots to be able to do uh, multiple different things. They also have to be able to program that the robots actually drive themselves for uh, autonomous period and also for skills autonomous. The people that were talking about the engineering notebooks, as you can see, they're very proud of those books. Um, they've spent a lot of time documenting um, the design process and their build and every, their daily activities. So they're very, very proud of working on this robot. We started in August and we're still going. And I want to introduce my assistant coaches, um, Ryan Dickinson. <laughs> and the, my other assistant coach is Mrs. Hansen. <laughs> Mrs. Hansen is also the, I know you heard about our tournament last, uh, two weeks ago, and she is the tournament coordinator for the whole tournament, so she is the lovely lady that created and ran that tournament very, very well, so we're really proud. Do you want to see robot, one of the robots in action? Let's show one of them in action. All right. All right, Andy, I know you got yours on. I don't think you have yours on. So go ahead. You, you think, can you, okay, and why don't you bring yours forward so then they can go turn it. Amber, go around. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Amber, go on the side now. Do not, they will not shoot. Because if they shoot, you might get injured. <laughs> they shoot these flags at a very high, uh, high rate, so I told them they cannot shoot. Each one is a little bit different. Uh, we have a flywheel, we have a uh, catapult, and we also have a um, puncher. So each of the robots are different. Go ahead, turn yours on. Amber, go turn yours on. And I will say, when some of our previous classes have gone down to the state when we're there at the OSBA, 
we're always so very, very proud of some of the previous classes that have been down there to see the things that our outstanding students do here. All these uh, teams earlier in the year have qualified for states, mm -hmm. so we are competing on Friday. Oh, wow. So we leave at 5.15 in the morning. Mm -hmm. okay. So we, we, we have been working on making sure everything, so hopefully they're um, at states this time, they only have three chances to get to world, so there's, there's a chance, but it's a tough competition this year. So. Outstanding. We thank you all so much. Thank for you for thank you all. Please give me a round of applause. And because they're in the middle of getting ready for a tournament, they're going to pack their things oh, and go are. back to work tonight. So <laughs> go get them. Good luck. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all again for coming. Thank you. So, I'll yield the floor back to the mayor. <laughs> well, I've been trumped. I mean, there's no good in that, right? Now. All right, well, uh, I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, all of you for being here. Um, this is a packed room, no doubt, uh, but I can tell you that the people watching what is happening tonight uh, reside far outside of these walls. Uh, there is a lot of uh, there's a lot of attention on what is going on here in Lorraine, and rightly so. Uh, but before I begin uh, my comments, you know, coincidence can happen in life sometimes. Certainly, there's different things that can, for whatever reason, happen at the same time. I, I happen not to believe that coincidence happens very often, such as today when we receive a letter uh, from uh, Mr. Hardy uh, talking about walking back uh, his you know, edict that all teachers had to reapply and, and turning the high school into an empowerment school. Uh, I don't believe in that because he, he references State Superintendent Paulo Di Maria in the letter in his discussion with him. And then just some hours later, we hear from Paulo Di Maria, no, no uh, advance notice to the mayor of the city, the school board, anybody else, that there is going to be a new chair to the Academic Distress Commission, uh, a chair who resides in the city of Columbus. Now, this, this after last week, uh, Chronicle-Telegram editor Emeritus Andy Young asked Governor DeWine about House Bill 70. And Governor DeWine said, you know, I believe Ohio is a local government state. I believe decisions should be made locally. We need to look at ch and changing this to bring more you know, local decision made, making back to the fray. And I completely agree. And, and by the way, I, I believe Mike DeWine is an honorable man. I, I really believe that he, he believes that. Yet, the state superintendent today, when having a chance to try to correct that, appoints a Columbus resident to chair our academic distress commission. Uh, there's something going on here. I'll get into that a little bit later in my remarks. But I want to say this to the school board. Uh, thank you for having this meeting. To Chief Rivera, thank you for being here. Your presence is uh, definitely needed and felt. Uh, to Distress Commission members Cawthon and Xander, thank you for being here. But if you recall, I sat in this same general vicinity some weeks ago and called for a joint meeting. A meeting with the CEO, a meeting with the Distress Commission, and a meeting with the school board. And you can see clearly who is here in this room and who is not here in this room. And I would say, bottom line, uh, it's, it's disappointing. I sit here very disappointed with the decision making, uh, not only not to attend, but certainly the decision making going on in Columbus right now, particularly with the next, uh, or who they named as the next chair. But I, I say disappointing, but not unexpected. Um, when I called for this meeting, I, I, I fully did not expect Mr. Hardy to attend. Uh, and you know, I wish for the best for the distress commission, but as you can see, Two of the members are here, the school board's appointee and the mayor's appointee uh, are sitting here, the other two are not. So since that meeting though, what we have seen in this community is 
chaos, it's controversy, it's continued op-ed editorials in the Chronicle Telegram, in the Morning Journal, about what is happening. And I've heard from many of you. I will say this is my beginning of my eighth year as mayor. There's been a lot of issues that, uh, that I've dealt with, that we've dealt with, some a lot easier than others, some real tough, some controversial. House Bill 70 is probably the issue I have heard most from all of you about. Mm -hmm. The tweets, the emails, the, the texts, the appointments to the office, stopping me at breakfast, stopping me on the street. House Bill 70 takes the cake in terms of the issue that you all care about. And by your attendance tonight, it certainly indicates that you do care about it. And you care about it, I certainly care about it. Uh, and look, I don't care who you are, whether you like certain board members, whether you don't like the CEO, whether you support the CEO. What I'm saying is House Bill 70, this system in this situation in Lorraine right now is simply not sustainable. This cannot go on. It is not sustainable. I said uh, in an interview here recently at City Council, rather, if left unchecked, we are on a path to destruction. This district is on a path to destruction if this is left unchecked and somebody doesn't intervene and intervene soon. And look, if you read House Bill 70, like you, you, you read a story sometimes and you wonder what the ending is. After you read House Bill 70, it should be pretty clear what the ending is. The ending is when you remove local power and local control and local authority, people who are directly, directly you know, accountable to all of you, when you remove that, well, what do you expect? Look at what's going on in Youngstown. I talked to Mayor Tito Brown just last week. He's got the same issues we have here. East Cleveland's off to a roaring start. They've already got problems with their new CEO and their, their school board. And I've talked to other mayors in the state who are very concerned too, because guess what? Dayton is next. Columbus within two years. This week, Columbus actually has parent groups, organized residents such as yourselves getting together saying, what are we gonna do about this thing? You know, it's not far off to say Toledo, Akron, Canton. They are on the cusp as well. When you remove local government in a local government state, and, and this is what the governor has said, this is, this is a recipe for disaster. And I don't want to give a constitutional lecture here, but this was the, one of the very debates at our, at our constitutional convention when our country was founded. What role should local government have? Should it be a stronger federal government? Should it be a stronger local government? And we have the protections we have today in our Constitution and the Bill of Rights because local government won out. And local government still, throughout this country, particularly in Ohio, it matters, it makes a difference, it's closest to the people. What happens when you remove that? What happens when you remove local power? Look what we have going on now. There's no separation of powers. There's no checks and balances to what is occurring. There is none of that that local elected leadership brings to the table. And so what the state did was they created and they gave it a fancy title. They called it a CEO. Why did they call it a CEO? Well, they wanted to bring a business mindset to it. But as the Morning Journal indicated just recently, this is not a private enterprise. This is a public school district with public dollars. And they ought to be accounted for. And there ought to be some accountability and responsibility of the leadership of this district. And so what you have, though, is you've got little oversight. Um, and you, you've seen the disaster slowly starting to build. And so when you don't answer to anybody, look at it, it's like it's a normal thing in life. You don't have to answer to anybody, whether it's a boss, whether you know, you're talking to kids and parents. If you don't have to answer to anybody, you become emboldened. You feel you don't have to explain your positions. And so what you get is what my appointee to the Distress Commission has gotten. Don't question. Better not question, because if you question, that means you're against. Don't, don't think to you know, question, because if you question, you're offending. You know, don't think to question, because to question is to blindside. And you know what? My favorite is, to question is being political. Well, they're just being political. There's nothing political about exercising your right to speak out about what is going on in your community. I don't care if you're sitting at this table. I don't care if you're in this crowd. There is nothing wrong with that. There's also nothing wrong with the free press. And you know what? As a mayor, 
I get beat up in the press all the time. I don't always agree what they write or how they write it about me or the Cleveland news stations and how they portray things sometimes, but you know what? A free press is absolutely essential to a functioning democracy. To cut out our free press from meetings with the school district, one of the key ways people in this community get information about what's going on in the schools is absolutely ludicrous and it should not stand. So we're looking at this and we're seeing in this community today, I believe the worst vices of, of House Bill 70. <coughs> Members of the very commission the CEO is to report to, five member commission, doesn't weight anyone more than the other other than somebody's called chair. They all have an equal vote. To think that chastising a member of the commission and criticizing them and saying they're on the wrong side and they, they don't care about children's education, these five people are the appointing authority of this individual. So now all of a sudden what we have is we have an individual who believes that not, he, doesn't, he doesn't have to answer to five people, he only has to answer to three. The other two, the board's appointee, the mayor's appointee, We'll sprinkle some local, you know, local appointment power in, but really, I don't have to answer them because I've got the three state people. That is the view. That's why you see who's here tonight here, and that's why you see others who are not here tonight. So I would say this. Right now, unfortunately, Lorraine is more the poster child of the disaster that is House Bill 70 in Youngstown. We have moved ahead of Youngstown. You all have experienced it this past week with, again, now, I believe it's 10 or 14 days ago, I'm not reconstructing buildings. Then at a town hall, it's announced I'm going to reconstruct buildings. And then a day later, a teacher's meeting, closed door meeting where a school board member was kept off premises. Again, ridiculous. Uh, you have that meeting and then just four or five days later, you know, another meeting uh, that or a, a letter rather. And before I go any further, I, I, I did read the CEO's letter and I want to read a couple snippets. And I'm sorry for being long-winded, but I, this all needs to be out. It needs to be vetted. It needs to be on the record. Here's a... Here's a few snippets. Suspending the process will allow us to collectively and collaboratively identify and implement the changes necessary to ensure our scholars succeed. That's number one, collaboratively. The past two days have shown me what is possible if we collectively and collaboratively co com or continue to commit to an unparalleled willingness to step up in the moments of challenge. That's collaborative number two. Something that can only happen with your voices at the table. We're at a table tonight. Not all voices are present. That we continue our conversation and come together around solutions to create the Lorraine High we all want. One that leads us to a level of collaboration that will bring us to what is truly possible for all of our scholars. That's collaboration number three. It is fully possible for all adults to work together to create a collaborative approach. That's collaborative number four. Through this level of collaboration, our path is clear and full of promise. Five times, and I may have miscounted, five times at least, the word collaboration is mentioned in this letter. In the last year and a half, what has not occurred is collaboration. It hasn't occurred with the school board. It hasn't occurred with the mayor's appointee and, and the school board's appointee to the distress commission. And you know, it certainly hasn't uh, occurred with what I would call other community leaders. And to, to read this letter, I, I just sit here, I'm dumbfounded. Like I'm reading this thing going, what plan? We, we have to reside on different planets here. To talk about this, to not show up to meetings, to, you know, within, within hours of my letter being sent out, to patently object to any kind of joint meeting, again, it's just, I, I think it's a complete and utter disservice to the taxpayers of this district, to the teachers of this district, to the staff, and look, most importantly, who nobody's talking about, to the students of this district. <laughs> So look, you're, you're going to hear many issues tonight. Um, you're going to hear about what's going on in the buildings. I don't pretend to be an educator. I don't pretend to know about curriculum. But what I can say is what I'm seeing in my community. It, it, it is not right. Um, I believe there's some short-term as well as longer-term fixes that, you know, as your mayor, I am committed to working toward 
in Columbus. The wheels are, are, uh, are ready in motion. My issue is an issue of leadership. Um, I just view leadership as, as you lead with people. Leadership is relational. Uh, I believe you make relationships, you win hearts and minds over, and you try to move forward to achieve your vision um, in that way. I don't think threats get it done. I don't think name calling gets it done. I don't think uh, unnecessarily instilling fear into the high school, which let's be honest, permeated to the rest of the schools in the district, that does not get it done, in my opinion, as a leader. And, you know, I hoped here tonight we would start a new dialogue. I gave it a shot, uh, and, you know, we, we see where it's at, and, and that's where, where it's going to be. Uh, I, I would not look at this as a dead end. I don't look at, at the new chair as a dead end. I believe we have a lot more work to do. Uh, I've committed myself to working with other cities, with working with the uh, state administration to fix this thing once and for all. I debated a lot about whether to seek a third term as mayor. Um, you know, I felt two terms was a, was a good point. I, I liked where things were at. We've got so many good things going on in the city, downtown, a hotel, uh, housing development in, in uh, you know, the west side of the city, both the Lorraine and school districts. We're, we're seeing it everywhere. But the bottom line is this city cannot move forward with the turmoil in this school district. I decided to throw my name back in the ring and we'll see where it lands. But I'm going to marry the rest of the year. And here's what I can tell you. And I'm going to repeat it at my State of the City on Thursday. This issue is the number one priority right now for this city. And I'm going to work every day to make sure that this thing gets fixed for all of you because what's going on is absolutely ridiculous. Thank you. I'm going to call on the 280C members and see if you guys have, they have a presentation for us. I hope you guys can all see the board. Good evening, everybody. My name is Diane Alexander. I am the mayor's appointee on the Academic Distress Commission. And when I was appointed by the mayor, uh, Ms. Mr. Rittenauer, I made some promises. And those promises are to the public, the community of Lorraine City Schools. I promised that I come into this objectively and that I would examine the truth by data-driven facts of what is going on currently in the state of the schools. Since early February, Mr. Koth and I have been busy um, meeting with teachers, talking with teachers. We did some LEA listening sessions. We completed 332 surveys from the teachers, and I'm going to go over those results tonight. And I, again, I make a promise to all of you that all of the evidence presented here tonight is based on data, facts, and truthful reports coming directly from our employees, our teachers, and our parents. And I want to apologize first because the intention was to have the screen up here so people could see that's not going to happen. Our clicker is not working. So we're going to sit here and go through the screens. If after, at the end of this, if anybody wants a copy of my report, I will be happy to share it with anybody that requests. All survey responses are reflected of the district's improvements and developments from August 2017 and working towards the goals and commitments outlined in the Lorraine Promise. The number of teacher surveys completed is 332. There are six questions asked on this survey. Question number one, the district has provided enhanced curriculum including textbooks, teaching materials, software, and technology to support quality instruction. 74% of the teachers strongly disagree or disagree. 14% are neutral. Question number two. My building administrators are knowledgeable instructional leaders that have enhanced my instructional practices by providing purposeful and meaningful feedback about teaching strategies and lesson planning. The results, 53% strongly disagree or disagree and 23% are neutral. Question number three. The teachers and building administrators work together as collaborative and cohesive teams in the best interest of students. The results, 44% strongly disagree or disagree, and 25% are neutral.
Question number four, my building administrators have consistently high expectations for student behavior, responsibility, and accountability. 55% strongly disagree or disagree, and 16% are neutral. Question number five, professional development opportunities have developed my instructional competence by producing data-driven results of improved student learning outcomes. 79% strongly disagree or disagree, and 13% are neutral. And then number six, the culture and climate throughout the district is positive, and I feel valued and respected as a teaching professional. 88% strongly disagree or disagree, and 8% are neutral. The rest of our report is going to outline six district urgencies that we have revealed throughout of our research and our discussions through reports of the survey responses and through a series of LEA teacher listening sessions. This report also includes uh, information from LCS administration, teachers, parents, support staff, and community members. Urgency number one. School safety, excessive physical violence. For example, 22 fights reported in a two week period from the end of January to early February at Lorraine High School. Nine fights in one day at Southview Middle School. Students fighting in hooded sweatshirts covering their heads so they cannot be identified on videos. Also videos are being glorified as well on social media. Hooded sweatshirts were permitted after the student code of conduct was not properly updated. LHS panic button, no protocol for emergencies for building staff. In fact, one of the teachers told me the most effective way to get help is to run into the hallway and scream for help because there's no protocol for the panic button. LHS building safety plan was not given to staff members until September of 2018, roughly five weeks after the start of the school year. Severe lack of student accountability from administrators and deans to minimize suspension rates, creating chaos in buildings and classrooms and disruption with instruction. LMS progressive <laughs> discipline plan was not given to teachers until February 5th, 2019. Student emergency medical authorization forms continue to be incomplete, missing and or not updated in progress book. This creates a huge barrier for teachers trying to contact parents when numbers and contact information has not been updated in the system. Outbreaks of head lice and concern of bed bugs coming into the buildings. No protocol or confidence with this administration on how to handle these cases. A teacher reported eight cases of live lice in one classroom. Two of the three Mercy clinics have been closed this year due to lack of space and there is a shortage of school nurses. Okay, I'm going to discuss the urgency too, but before I do that, I would like to introduce myself to some of you who may not know me. Uh, my name is Steve Cawthon. I am a Lorraine High School social studies teacher. I have been in the district since 1991, so I've been around a while. And I'm also proud to say my daughter is a graduate of Lorraine City Schools. And just to kind of share a little personal story with that, um, we talk about what we don't have here and what we don't do. And to think that my daughter works for a Fortune 500 company and uses the phrase in her office, Lorraine Grit, because she's proud to be from Lorraine, Ohio. And some of the things that we've heard tonight from the mayor, Mrs. Zander, for myself, it's very troubling. And she contacted me earlier today and said, Dad, I wish I could come up there and make a statement on behalf of the people of Lorraine because she is still proud to be from Lorraine even though she's living in Columbus currently. So we do do a lot of good things here, no matter what some people may lead you to believe. As far as the urgency, point number two, teachers working conditions and building climate. And in the district, there has been a situation that seems to have manifested itself and it is not a good situation with the morale of teachers 
and the way in which they're dealt with as professionals. Reports of hostile and toxic work environments in buildings. A culture of fear and distrust throughout the district. And one of the things that I made abundantly clear when I was first named to this commission, and I felt in order for any of this to work with Mr. Hardy and this community and this group of teachers and these students is there had to be trust. If you don't have trust at the beginning of this process, you will not have success. The fact that there is not trust has led this situation down the road that we are currently going down. We've had teachers that have sought medical attention for mental breakdowns, anxiety impacting families, and overall quality of life. Something that we've never had in my 28 years in this district, I have never seen and heard, dealt with the phone calls that I have dealt with in the last year and a half. It's beyond troubling. Five teachers have been walked out or removed from teaching assignments for several weeks, two months, and the teachers were returned with no found charges with rotating substitutes, chaos, and lost instructional time for their students. So unfortunately, there was not due process for these staff members that were unceremoniously walked out under false pretenses. OTEST evaluations are not being administered to high professional standards and are improperly completed due to inexperience and unlicensed administration. One of the things that I asked at a commission meeting was, Mr. Hardy, can you guarantee me that the people you are bringing into our schools are not only high quality, but are certified and they're experienced? I felt like I was lied to because there are too many, and I, and I feel bad saying this, I feel like I'm making a blanket statement, but some of the people that have been hired are learning on the job. We cannot have administration learning on the job in Lorraine. In addition, as the mayor has alluded to, all staff members at Lorraine High School have been informed they would need to reapply for their positions. So when that bombshell was dropped Thursday evening at the town hall, then we have a situation where over the weekend it kind of settled in. I don't know about the rest of you, my weekend was ruined. And I think every Lorraine City school teacher realized that first it's the high school, when is it going to be me? Okay? And I have tenure, I've been here 28 years. Would I probably have my job back? Yes. But I'm going to have to reapply for my job as an educator in this district after doing and devoting my life to the kids in the community of Lorraine. And that was troublesome for me. Then today we find out, well, no we're not. And there was a heartfelt message in that even though when I watched the Channel 3 story yesterday, I didn't feel that there was a change of heart yesterday. I feel the change of heart came today. Did that come from going to Columbus today is the question that I might want an answer to. Or maybe I don't want the answer to that. In addition, there have been excessive administrative walkthroughs that have been disruptive of instruction and student learning. I'm real honest, as a teacher, my classroom door is open all the time. Administrators can walk in and out. But there have been cases of 10 times in one day, eight times in one day, teachers trying to teach an administrator standing at their door with a cart and a laptop, typing away and looking at them as if, what are you really doing in this classroom? Or being told they don't care about their kids. That, to me, is breaking that trust that I so dearly asked at the beginning of this process. Urgency number three. These revolve around ethical concerns and legal matters of the district. There's a continued insubordination and refusal by the CEO to provide records requests and schedule meetings as requested with myself as a commissioner. Numerous lawsuits against the, against the LCS, against Lorraine City Schools under the new CEO appointment. There are violations suspending students with disabilities beyond the maximum 10 day limit. It's a violation under IDEA. Middle school reports of students being charged $5 to replace student badges and no finance record or deposit has been made for this collection or charge of money. House Bill 410, which is a student regulation um, law, is not being followed in multiple buildings throughout the district. 
LHS unlicensed administrator allegedly charged with inciting hostile work environments while he is still reporting to work, never sent home for further investigation, like our teachers. General Johnny Wilson, principal, creating unprofessional social media posts about LCS teachers and staff. A former retired administrator was fired from the district for falsifying time cards and now working back in the district, rehired under this current administration. General Johnny Wilson administrator sent one ounce of marijuana over to central office to a secretary in a paper envelope through the inner school courier service. <laughs> Continuing, unlicensed administrators suspending and expelling students. The skewing and falsifying of district data, and I have a, a running list of, of skewing and falsifying district data. This trend has been going on for the past 18 months. The CEO data is inaccurate and misleading to the public. CEO presentations and interviews are inflated and untruthful. Discipline reports are skewed. Teacher attendance data are lies. Yeah. Yeah. Building administration. Yeah. Building administration, fabricating instructional rounds data. Administrators, including principals and chiefs, are not reporting sick time, personal time, and or maternity leave. Wow. <laughs> Urgency number four, academic and curricular concerns. Significant gaps and deficits in curriculum across the district. Title I and tutor services removed from classroom instruction to support administrative salaries. The English language learner services and support are lacking significantly across the district. A disproportionate number of special education and regular education students in inclusion classrooms. Blatant disregard and failure to respond to the special education teacher's request for administrative coverage for IEP meetings after several attempts. Special education teachers being pulled for substitute coverage so they cannot provide services to their students. District RTI is not effectively being implemented district-wide. Then we have standards-based grading. And luckily for me at the high school, I have not had to deal with that nightmare, but I have heard the stories and I have talked to parents and some of my friends, students, and, and they're like, what is going on with standards-based grading? Well, there was inadequate teacher training. Students and parents do not understand it. Decreased parental involvement due to lack of understanding. Grade calculations on report cards are incorrect and not being addressed by administration. Student lack effort because they don't see the new system as grades. I've had that told to me by one of my friend's daughters. Uh, you know what, I don't get an A or B, so what's a one, two, three, it's not the same. Athletic eligibility concerns for middle school students, no academic accountability with this new system. Also with SPARC, grant funded tutors to support students in literacy intervention pre uh, K through five, turned away in all buildings except two elementary schools. And new purchase service vendors, including Kickboard, Whetstone, ANET, Unbound, Engage New York, Ineffective. We have poor implementation, lack of training, and we also have vendors which are charter school affiliates of the CEO. Yeah. Urgency number five, district finances and the five-year forecast. The district's five-year forecast concerns deal with personnel services, employee benefits, retirements, and purchase services. There are drastic increases in purchase services, drastic decreases in personnel services and employee benefits and retirement. There are $43 million of general fund and Title I funds being appropriated in a 598 account. And I'd like an explanation why, if I could direct that question to Chairman.
So the 598 account is a pooled account. Um, it is the, the idea of when you're budgeting, instead of budgeting grant funds separately, you're budgeting the needs ahead of time and then you're rolling in and doing a percentage breakout basically. So you do an overall, I think it works out to about 92% general fund funded for the 598 and it's about 8% grant funded which is uh, title funds. And why are we doing it this way? I compared our forecast to other forecasts and it's completely different. There are other districts in the state that do this. Um, I actually, of all things we go through and everything else, I prefer it this way because it's a more, it's a more proactive approach to budgeting. Um, but, you know, it's, you are able to look at your overall need and you're not backing into, typically when you have grant dollars, you're backing into at the end of the year trying to spend those. We're looking at the overall need and then based on that, we're steering the funds we have towards that need instead and of the other way around. Is there a breakdown or explanation of where this money's being funneled? Oh, of course. Is it noted on the Lorraine City Schools website or on the OD website? Is it under your notes? We did not see a breakdown of those of that of those no, funds. And, and I'd be happy to sit down. It's that's not an issue. That's um so we have the school pool, the school pooling funding sheets that actually show the breakdown. And I could sit down. I'd and that should be open down. to the public. That made the public aware. <laughs> any, let me reiterate that too. My books are always open to the public. My finances, I, the one thing, no matter who I'm reporting to, my duty as a treasurer to keep my license is to have my books available to the public. I have no secrets. I will happily sit down and show you the pooling sheets and how. So you 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 mentioned the. The drastic differences in the personnel and employee benefits. It's due to, due to that 598, and I'll happily show you how those funds are steered and what they are being spent on specifically. I have no problem with that. Was that whose idea was it to do that? Just to uh, change that financial structure. Um, Elyria City Schools does not present their financial forecast that way. The CEO. Okay, I have Urgency 6, and the focus of Urgency 6, obviously, which has been the focus in the last few days, has been Lorraine High School. And as a teacher in the building, um, obviously, it's a very passionate and important thing to me. And I'm gonna give you some brief numbers of some of the things that we found and then go through a few items as well. As far as Lorraine High School teachers, uh, the feeling as far as have not been supported by current Lorraine City School Administration according to the recent LHS data from the teacher survey responses, the district has provided enhanced curriculum, including textbooks, teaching materials, software, and technology to support quality education, and 81% strongly disagree or disagree with that. My building administration or administrators have consistently high expectations for student behavior, responsibility, and accountability. 73% strongly disagree with that. The culture and climate throughout the district is positive and I feel valued and respected as a teaching professional. 88% strongly disagree with that. So the items that Lorraine High School teachers have requested over the last 18 months and have been denied. No SRO or Comprehensive Building Crisis Safety Plan or Drill Practices. At this time, I don't believe there's an SRO in the building. Title Tutors, Attendance Policy, Updated Textbooks and Teaching Materials, Curriculum Support, Consistent Discipline Support and Student Accountability, Class Sizes Being Reduced, Vacant Teaching Positions Being Filled, Balance of Co-Taught Special Ed Education Inclusion Sections, and approved ELL services and supports. And here's some things to kind of think about because last week, I don't know about how some of you felt, but I felt like I was told I wasn't good enough to be a teacher at Lorraine High School, okay? From 2010 to 2014, Lorraine High School is one of the highest performing schools in the district. Today, the majority of the same staff and teachers remain at the high school. Lorraine High School students and staff have moved and or been relocated three times in six years. From 2014 to present, a five-year time span, four different principals and 18 
assistant principals. There's been a change of leadership that frequent. And I use the professional sports model. When you are changing coaches consistently, the lack of success is probably going to be minimal. From 2010 to the present, we have had five superintendents slash CEOs in eight years. Again, changing of leadership, different plans, moving in directions that aren't consistent. And the unstable leadership and ever-changing district-wide initiatives have all affected the ability for our teachers to do what they want to do, which is to educate their children. I will leave you with a little history note because that's one of the things that I teach at the high school. Some of them are sitting right there and they have smiles on their faces. Do you guys remember Benjamin O. Davis from Tuskegee Airmen? Yes. Okay. He was a famed African-American military hero and leader of the Tuskegee Airmen. And he once stated when he felt that his pilots were being unjustly attacked by the powers that be. And he said this, you invite us to a poker game, hand us a fixed deck, and then wonder why we can't win. Yeah. <laughs> Oftentimes that is the feeling of all Lorraine teachers in regards to what they have asked for and what they need in their classrooms and schools to help our students and the community. Thank you. Hardy's announcement that the Lorraine High School teachers would have to reapply for their jobs a couple days, I firmly believe that this is a blatant attack on teachers. And as you can see here after listening and as evidenced uh, by our report, this is a leadership problem. And until the commissioners and the community address the leadership problem, we will not be able to move forward. Next steps moving forward, these are critical steps. We need to legal uh, action against the Hardy plan to reconstitute Lorraine High School, although that's been um, changed as of this afternoon. That plan was in violation of House Bill 70. School re reconstitution bylaws, if you check out page 15, subset <coughs> H1, page 16, letter F, the whole plan to reconstitute Lorraine High School was a violation. Lorraine Academic Distress Commission must convene immediately following the appointment of the new chair. And I will make sure that I reach out to our fellow commissioners to request a meeting as soon as possible. With that, we need a forensic audit to be completed to analyze the district finances and spending. We also need a comprehensive Ohio Department of Education audit of the district's current operational standards and practices. Yes. Eighteen months ago, we were in academic distress. Eighteen months later, under House Bill 70, the district is operating in an environment with unsafe schools, a demoralization of staff and teachers, and the leadership has been reckless. On behalf of Mr. Cawthon and myself on the commission, we would like to declare a state of emergency for Lorraine City Schools. <laughs> and fellow board members, I appreciate your support because I do believe we are in a state of emergency. Thank you for that. Um, so, I will actually turn it over to Mr. DiMatteo. Based on the information that we had heard and obviously the uh, continued incompetence and lack of policy implementation, the complete and total disregard for the safety of our students, teachers, and staff, uh, the intentional and retaliatory attacks on our teachers, and the fact that CEO Hardy and this administration have completely lost control of this school district. I would like to uh, walk on the following resolution, and I will read it word for word. Whereas the Lorraine City School District was subject to House Bill 70 in 2017, despite every other district except Youngstown having a safe harbor from state test scores until last year, and whereas an academic distress commission was named and selected David Hardy CEO in July 2017, whereas under House Bill 70, CEO Hardy has complete operational, managerial, and instructional control of the district, 
with the elected Board of Education only retaining the power to levy tax dollars and otherwise eliminating local control from the community and whereas CEO David Hardy has publicly refused to meet with or share information with the elected Board of Education or the mayor of the city of Lorraine and whereas Hardy has continuously displayed a lack of transparency failure, failure to engage our community and the in, inability to implement effective instruction on operational policies and whereas under Hardy and his administration, the district's academic performance and enrollment has actually decreased while the operating budget spending has increased. Whereas Hardy spends local tax dollars without public explanation or oversight process. Whereas reports of violence in our schools have increased and Hardy has failed to establish and implement building safety plans and district crisis plan putting the safety of students and staff in danger. Whereas Hardy and his administration have not been transparent or consistent in creating and sharing comprehensive educational plans and strategies to raise scores, instead choosing to focus on using data against the teachers and engaging in retaliatory actions resulting in wrongful termination and suspension of administrators, teachers, and staff. Whereas Hardy and his administration continue to create a hostile work environment by leading with fear, intimidation, and threats of retaliation. Whereas in March 2018, the Board of Education voted 5-0 that they would have no confidence in CEO Dave Hardy and the direction of the school district. Whereas Learning Education Association recently conducted a staff survey that resulted in a majority vote of no confidence as well. Whereas our community is growing, growing increasingly apprehensive about Hardy's failure and leadership and now therefore be it resolved by the Board of Education of Lorraine City School District that the Board of Education expresses support for our staff, our teachers, our families, and our students, and its concern for the current status of our district and declares the Lorraine City School District in a state of emergency. Be it further resolved that the Treasurer be directed to enter this resolution upon minutes of the Board of Education. I need a mo that is the motion. Uh, we do need a second to walk it on. Support. Roll call. Mr. DeMacchia? Yes. Mr. Sturgill? Yes. Mr. Ballard? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. And I'd like to make a motion to approve. Support. Roll call. Mr. DeMacchia? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Ballard? Yes. Mr. Sturgill? Yes. Thank you. And I just, you know, if I could, you know, I, I just want to be clear on a couple different things. When House Bill 70 first came to Lorraine City School District, I, I think people need to understand that <coughs> this Board of Education and the former administration, as well as this entire district, embraced this bill and tried to be a good partner, uh, tried to collaborate with the Ohio Department of Education and State Superintendent Paula DeMaria, uh, as well as uh, former Superintendent Dick Ross. Uh, we tried every approach we possibly could to try to make this work, and the state of Ohio and uh, the Department of Ed Ed Education completely uh, disregarded the voice of this community. Uh, I am uh, inspired by the amount of people that are in this room. Uh, do not be fooled by the smoke screen that occurred today. And I think that it is clear that a few years back, uh, the governor tried to pass Senate Bill 5 and it got failed miserably because they were trying to bust up the unions and break up contract. And uh, I think this is just a thumb in the eyeball of all of us and our taxpayers and all the voters. Uh, House Bill 70, make no mistake, is an attack on public education. And at the end of the day, it is an attack on unions, bargaining units. And I hope that all of us continue to fight against this because this is a strong message to the state of Ohio, to the Department of Education, our state superintendent, that this community will be unified and we will continue to fight against this bill and get our school district back. Recently, we've inquired with the uh, city law director, Mr. Pat Riley, <coughs> to come in and, and help us. And he, along with our legal, uh, have gotten together and come up with a protocol. So I would like to introduce Mr. Tony Giardini and Mallory Santiago to come up with uh, some of the things that they've, how we're moving forward. I guess they're going to explain quickly how we'll move forward and working in this new relationship, in this current relationship. Sure. Uh, 
Please. Uh, through the president to the board. Um, I'm Mallory Santiago. Um, I'm an assistant Lorraine City Law Director and assistant prosecuting attorney for the city. Um, I work at the pleasure of Patrick Riley, who is your elected law director for the city of Lorraine. So if we've not met, hello, we've gotten a speeding ticket, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, we were asked to jump on in. Um, we are legally bound to represent the Board of Education. Um, attorney Gerardini has uh, in the last several years um, been taking on many of the legal matters for the board um, but the board has requested some of our help to assist attorney jardine or rather he assist us um, in making sure that the board has everything that it needs um, lawfully um, so we intend to do that um, we have talked to president ballard um, what we're going to do is set up a process by which we can organize and streamline the board communicating with the law department and with attorney jardine um, I think this will do two things. I think it will uh, minimize confusion, so we're not asking questions over and over, um, and we get one clear answer for the board. And I think it will um, maximize our resources, and isn't that always a good thing? Um, so we won't be doubling up on efforts. Um, we'll collaborate with one another, the law department and uh, Attorney Jardini. Um, I've provided um, a memorandum to the board um, to review. Um, it's not an order, it's rather just a suggestion as to how we might continue our communication so that we're clear and we're organized. Um, I recommend that you take a look at it. If you might suggest any changes, we're completely open to that. This is just a recommendation. And I don't know if Attorney Jared, do you wanted to add anything to that? I, I would only say that uh, basically the law director's office is doing what uh, it's required statutorily to do if the Board of Education so requests. As a matter of fact, I got my introduction to school law when I was an assistant law director 35 uh, years ago. And at that time, the law director's office provided legal services to the school district and by law cannot charge the district for those services. Um, as the board knows, um, I've been uh, in the last 18 months, uh, my role as legal counsel to the board has been uh, limited to uh, just coming to your meetings and uh, representing the school board at the Board of Revision. That's, a, that's something that will continue on. I've talked to the law director about that. Uh, we had previously been um, outsourcing uh, the tax work uh, to an outside law firm and I got together with Treasurer Hill actually just during the transition process and uh, we've come up with a process by which we've reduced legal fees from about $80,000 a year to $36,000 a year uh, over the past uh, uh, 12, 18 months that we've had this new program in place. I'll continue to do that because it will continue to save the district money. Uh, and otherwise, uh, what we've agreed is that uh, because, because House Bill 70, quite frankly, created such a mess in terms of how protocols should work uh, uh, we've decided, the law director and I have agreed that uh, you should communicate everything directly to the law director's office. If you get a lawsuit or administrative claim or if you need an opinion, uh, direct it to the law director and then as the law director deems appropriate, he, he may refer some of those things to me or he may not, uh, depending on whether or not he chooses to provide the service directly or if he wants me to. Uh, and if that's okay with the board, we'll, we'll proceed in that fashion. We, one thing we promise you is that you'll get clear, consistent, and efficient legal services uh, in this fashion. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Roger. So we are now going to enter into the hearing of the public, but I'm going to ask everyone, as you can see, we have a pretty large crowd, and we need to be uh, respectful of everyone's time. And so there will be a three minute limit on each person who comes to the mic. And um, Mr. Josh Hill will be my official timekeeper here. And please be respectful of everyone here and do not just exceed that limit and go off on tangents as we sometimes do, as we sometimes do. So at this point we will hear from the public. You will stand to the mic. Please speak into the mic, uh, state your name. Um, and limit your time to three minutes, please. We're open to the public.
Hello, my name is Stacy Vore, and I'm a 30-year math teacher from Lorraine City Schools. <laughs> and I'm not perfect, but neither is anyone else in this room. I have some issues. Lorraine High has issues. Lorraine City has issues. And I am here to tell you our students have lots of issues. Right. I'm here to say that I'm tired of hearing Lorraine City teachers, and Lorraine High in particular, bashed and accused of not doing right by our students. There are some legitimate issues at Lorraine High. As Mr. Cawthon mentioned earlier, we have not had a content-specific supervisor since 2003 when Fred Dahl died. We have not had new textbooks since 2004. We have cut and pasted curriculums since the early 2000s. We have not had consistent curricular materials and the standards have changed multiple times. We have serious attendance issues. We are, what, 52% chronically absent? It's ridiculous. This is exacerbated by our high school busing which we are not required to do, and we charge our students for. But yet, this year, with all of that and all of the issues that we took, this year, the first thing we worked on was restorative justice. <clears throat> now, frankly, I believe in restorative justice. I use it every day. But we were told to apply restorative justice to every discipline situation in this building. And we said, this is not going to work. <laughs> you can only use restorative justice in certain circumstances. And they said, it's going to be used in every circumstance. Well, what happened? We became the Lorraine High Fight Club. That's what News Channel 5 called us. That's what started all of our fights, because our kids posted on Facebook, you can do anything at Lorraine High, and nothing's going to happen. The most upsetting thing about all of that is, in January, we received a PD module. And in that PD module, it made it clear how restorative justice was supposed to be used. And it was not supposed to be used the way we were using it. Not anything about how it was supposed to be used was the way we were told to use it. <coughs> Next thing, shared attribution. Shared attribution is when our growth measure is a shared attribute. Well, the state of Ohio says that's a crappy, <laughs> crappy growth measure. It's so bad that the state of Ohio is gonna withdraw it as a choice within the next two years. We were moving to use it this year and use it against any ODA, ODE guidelines. Use it exactly the way they said not to use it. They said 5%, we said 50. Standards-based grading. Those elementary school teachers were left hanging. I used standard-based grading before. When we did, we had tests given to us, retests given to us, we had PDs, end services. They were just dumped with standards-based grading. As a matter of fact, they were just given some pamphlets last week. <laughs> we have an attendance policy to see that inconvenient students who are tardy, but does absolutely nothing about getting them here. As I said, you pay for busing if you're a high school student because it's not legally mandated. There's been no discussion of expanding busing. There's been no discussion of free transportation. And trust me when I tell you, our high school teachers are forking up that $25 to help pay kids get here. As a teacher, I was not involved in those decisions because those were district decisions. And I hate to say this, but I also know the biggest influence on in our children's lives is not their teacher. I wish it was. It's their family. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> Yet we are being accused of every, everything. Students are acting totally inappropriately. Often there's no or little consequences. And actually there are some parents who come in and back them up in their poor behavior. And I'm going to say to you as our community, that if multiple teachers are saying the same thing about your child, it's not the teachers. It's the child. And frankly, we cannot drop the race card on everything, people. We cannot.
Are we perfect? No. Is there room for improvement? Absolutely. But everyone needs to take responsibility for their part in our student success. And that includes this administration who's made some very poor decisions. Their students who, believe it or not, many show very, uh, very little lack of effort. Teachers, parents, and this community. I tell my students on a regular basis, and many of them here, if you come to school every day and you do what I say, I promise I will get you through. Yes. And it's sad for me to say that every semester there's some who don't make it through. Mm -hmm. But I want you to know I'm Stacy Vohr. And I promise you I'm pulling my weight and then some. And it's time for all of us to start pulling our weight. Amen. Across this community, across this district. Right. And it's time to stop pointing the finger at us. Right. Thank you. high school. I've been attending um, Learn City Schools for my entire life. I decided to come out and talk to you guys today about what's going on with the news and I'm very disturbed by because I'm hearing these news articles about my school. I'm bothered for many reasons. Number one, the teachers have to reapply for the jobs. The relationships I have established with many teachers at this Learn High will be tarnished. These teachers are my motivation to even get up, get out of my bed, and come to school. I feel that the administrators truly don't care about me. When I have bad days, they see me in the hall, but they won't talk to me. I'm very disturbed by the information that is being put out by publicly to our CEO that is ruining our reputation more than it already is. I read articles about Mr. Hardy talking about our attendance and test scores. Our attendance is very low because stu students have issues at home that could deal with before coming to school. I'm one of those students that can relate to that. Our test scores are also low because the students have to deal with these stuff at home and mentally stressed and have, have a hard time doing well in classes and on these tests. I feel Mr. Hardy has nothing, has done nothing to help our students improve on these tests. These, there, things are a lot better and different before he came in. <coughs> there are so many things that our other school have that we don't have, such as test prep that is not crammed into two days before the test. <laughs> More after school activities to keep us off the streets. And programs in the career tech program that other schools have that we don't. This is not about numbers. This is about our teachers and our students' lives are on the line. This is our school and not the CEO's playground. <laughs> student here at Lorraine High. Lorraine High, the home of the Titans, a place of diversity, pride, and success. A place where I can walk in and feel at home with my friends and even teachers. The educational part, <coughs> sorry, while important, is nothing without motivation and the drive to get up and go to school. Therefore, the social part must exist alongside the educational. Here in Lorraine High, it is blooming. The social, part, sorry, the social part has developed so much that for the rest of my life, I myself intend to follow in the advice of teachers wholeheartedly and keep in contact with them after high school, for the teachers are everything. My drive stems from the, from the motivation given by teachers. Sorry. The incentives, the discipline, and the companionship keeps morale and effort alive here. Sorry. So I'm nervous, you know. Breaking these contacts will leave students lost, lazy, and unsuccessful. Spite destroys, or spite, another thing, should never be observed in the premises of work and education. 
spite destroys the equ equilibrium placed to keep peace and prosperity in all aspects of life. Not just simply work and education, although. Outside, in that world outside of school, spite may have other definitions and objectives, but inside a place like this creates chaos, confusion, and anger, as you can all observe. <laughs> to solve this problem, we must dig into the very root, which is the attendance, test grades, and etc. Our bad rep stems from these problems and continues to do so. Yes, we may be underperforming, but a simple morale boost can fix this, not constant degradation and ridicule that we can see every day. Problems at home obstruct the view of students bombarded by problems they shouldn't even have yet, or at all. <coughs> While inside of this hole, the student receives immediate coverage on how poorly they are doing, and the administrative opinions on what needs to be changed, and the views that a report card must take all of their effort in order to su uh, succeed. You do not, it, oh my gosh. You do not expect, sorry, an infant to bathe, clothe, and survive on its own. In this predicament, you do not expect the student to be able to perfectly balance all things in life on their own. Children who are overwhelmed will buckle under pressure while they are being whipped by the man's remarks. Introduce that figuratively spoken, parental, parental care, sorry, Take more action instead of sitting behind a reporter's camera or an admin's desk and make the changes you wish to see. For the broken clock moves not unless the clockmaster himself changes out the parts and cares for the clock's ability to tell time. My name is Dave McFarland. <clears throat> I apologize, I have a cold. I am, uh, was hired here oh, six years ago as a football coach. And uh, I'd like to make sure that I emphasize that I believe in my heart and soul, and if you went in our locker room, you'd see it, that Lorraine and Lorraine kids have done more for me than I could ever give back to this community. And I'm proud to be a coach. Everything we've asked of our young people on the football field, in the locker room, our academics, everything we've asked, they've met and exceeded those goals. I'm really proud of our young men, and, and you, everybody that reads the newspaper knows how proud I am of our football team. Yeah. I'm also very proud of the kids I teach in the classroom, because now I'm, uh, I just became a new teacher. And I'm proud of the fact that as a new teacher, every time I push them a little bit farther, they stand up, they rise to the occasion. And I just believe our message needs to be that we have great kids here. We have kids just as good as anywhere in the country. They just need a lot of love and attention. And we all know that, but I'm real proud of our children and I'm proud to be a part of their, their lives, at least a small part. But the, really the reason I came up here, <clears throat> I'm an educator, I'm a retired educator. And I believe in my heart that from day one, from opening day, our teachers have been under attack. Every I just know I've been here now six years, and i lucky enough to teach in Reynoldsburg, Ohio, Elyria Catholic, Berea, and I know, and I can look at anybody in this room, I can look at anybody in the country and tell you, we have just as good as teachers as any other school in the state of Ohio. Or <laughs> and I truly believe that they Although I believe all teachers do more than is expected. The public doesn't really realize how much teachers do at all schools. But I really believe here our teachers go above and beyond, not only financially, but which their effort, and more importantly, their emotion, their love, because they leave here exhausted. Thank you. Thank you. Coach McFarland, can I ask you a question? Yeah. All right, Coach McFarland and I talk frequently. Okay, and I, he's not mentioning it, but I want him to take some credit because he really stepped up this year in a situation that he didn't have to. There was a class, and I don't know if you want to tell the story. You want me to tell the story because uh, you're you're living it. All right, let him well, tell the story. You know, it, it all goes back to coaching with me because that's at the time I was I'm most intimate with the football players. And you know, we meet those young men every day when they come into our field house, and we talk to them, 
we shake their hands, we go out of their way to make sure that every kid that walks in that field house, an adult coach shakes their hand, asks them how their day was, uh, talks them a little bit about the purpose of practice today. And uh, I was a little bit upset when one of my coaches came to me because he was concerned that two of our players had a science teacher or didn't have a science teacher and we were in week two and I said I would look into it. The kids were worried that they're turning assignments into subs, they're not getting the assignments back. What's gonna happen to their grades? Because we focus on grades so much out there. Uh, I then found out there was also an employability class that did not have a teacher. So I verbally had said to uh, the administration, you know, I am a certified social studies teacher. I'd be glad to do that if that is what would help. Uh, I, I, I just believe, I'm trying to teach our young men, stop complaining don't complain on a football field when something bad happens. You gotta be part of the solution in life. You gotta, you gotta be part of the solution in a community. And that's what being in a community is all about, being in a family. We're, we're a football family, we're a school family, we're a, a Lorraine community family. And I think it's important for me to be a role model. And so I had just decided that uh, uh, it's important for me to be part of the solution and not just complain. So I wrote an email on about week three saying that uh, I would teach the class uh, temporarily till you could find a teacher. I, I couldn't believe we couldn't find a teacher. Um, and uh, anybody that knows me, I'm kind of crazy. I, 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 I'm an emotional guy and uh, week four, five, six, I'm in the football season. So maybe I'm involved in it, but I'm not involved in it. But it is on my mind and I walk by the room and, and, and they're not, they, there's no curriculum. But at the end of the nine weeks, I was worried because I had a player in there and he needs to be eligible for the last week of the season and he got a 95% A for doing nothing. And uh, I was upset, but the season was over and I let it go and after, uh, so now we're into maybe week of 10 of the academic year. Uh, I really was, was contemplating the church and thinking about, you know, I'm not, I'm not the man I'm supposed to be. I'm complaining about Lorraine City Schools not having a teacher, but I'm doing nothing to solve that problem. So then I wrote a lengthy email saying that uh, I find it troubling. I, I, it's disturbing that, we, that we're putting our children in a classroom and we're sending the message that school doesn't matter, that class doesn't matter, that your work doesn't matter. And I expressed all my thoughts about it and they were pretty strong thoughts uh, about it. And I said, I'm, I'm not gonna keep offering, but I am willing to be part of the solution and I'll teach that class. And that got the ball rolling. And I'm really fortunate. I, it's just like I love the football and the football team. I love my class, uh, just like Stacy was talking a minute ago and the young people you're seeing up here speaking. I'm so proud of the kids in my class. I, I love them. I'm excited to come to school every day and teach them. We, we just have to get the message out that we have really wonderful children here and we have a wonderful staff. And I think we gotta stop berating our teaching staff here at Lorraine High School. Hi everyone, my name is Onyx Lopez. Um, I'm a 2014 graduate of Lorraine High School. Today I am here to show my support to a community who has become my family. The teachers and staff of Lorraine High School have taught me life lessons I would not have been able to learn elsewhere. I was taught how to persevere. I was taught how to be, how to be bold. I was taught how to show compassion and many other skills that have led me to become the successful woman I am today. I've been fortunate enough to come across benevolent teachers such as Mr. Maisie and life-changing coaches like Coach Feldman and Coach Rossitano who are somehow able to remain dedicated to their craft the same way they were when they first started. These teachers and coaches inspired me so much that after six years, I decided to come back and give to others what they've given me by becoming the assistant varsity girls basketball coach. It's discrediting, in my opinion, to even call them teachers when they are so much more than that. They are mentors, life coaches, and sometimes even like second mothers and fathers. I'm standing here today a graduate of Wright State University, a graduate of Lorraine County Community College, and most importantly, a proud graduate of Lorraine High School. I'm not sure if I'll ever get a chance to say this on a platform that's so relevant, um, but I would just like to say thank you to my absolutely incredible teachers and coaches, and just know that you guys have my support and the support of many others. <laughs>
Good evening. My name is Ms. Rhoda Lee. I'm here and I've listened to everything. And as one of the elders here in this community, and I've listened, I've concerned, I have volunteered time for many years here in the Rain City School. Walk in the hall in Conabear. Remember the years I've traveled the halls of Lorraine Admiral That's King? Well, I most respect. But we as a community, and listening to all that has come down, have to come together. Everyone knows, and most of you know, how I felt prior to House Bill 70 even coming into existence. She and I and a number of you, the mayor, and we have discussed that it was Mr. DeMarkey that said what you said. You wanted to, in the beginning, to try to embrace to see that everything worked well. But I said, as I said then, it was a bad bill. It is a move, it is a national trend, and it is to privatize education, where we would no longer have public education in this country again. That's what it's for. But we're talking about the problems and things that exist here in our school district. And I'm here to say I love Lorraine. As I said to the mayor some time ago, we're sitting on a jewel. We need to polish it really, really good. And everyone is talking about what they're gonna do. So as one of your elders, I have demands. One of those demands is to support our children. <coughs> our kids out here need us. We need, in our schools, we need nurses. We need to continue to have good teachers. We do have good teachers. I remember some of the older ones, Ms. Gloriosa, and some of the from that school where we were. And those were good days. But first of all, I want us to make another demand. And that demand is parental accountability. And that is for the parents to account for their children getting to school. We're legislating everything. Let's legislate that. And see to it that they have proper education. We need the best teachers. We need the resources in our school. We have many kids coming to school right now with various traumas from the environment a lot of times in which they live. They need us. They need the schools. They need to feel safe in the school. And we need to have the resources and the help that they may need through the family. We need nurses. We need counselors on our elementary level, not there. Not wait until they get to eighth, ninth grade to find out what their credits are, what they'll need to graduate. It is us and it is up to this community. Let's stop this bickering and foolishness and please come together. It is about the kids. That's what it's all about. It's about the kids and it's about their needs and where they'll be once they reach 18 years of age, and what this community has done to help them to get where they need to be. That's what I have to say. Let's stop it. Let's begin to come up. The statistical data, much of it's back in 2010, 2011, 2009. It's kind of as I talked to you back in 29, was it not? Mm -hmm. 29, 2010. That's right. And this is what we need to do. And if we don't come together and do it, this community is going down the drain, and we can't afford that. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Stacy Starr. I'm a proud graduate of um, 1996 Southview High School. And I am standing in front of you today to just say that if it wasn't for um, all of the wonderful teachers that I had here in Lorraine, I would not um, have been able to have the success that I was able to have in my career today. Um, and coming from the city that we come from and the grit that uh, Mr. Cawthorn uh, talks about, um, we are able to go out into anywhere in the world and really blend and meld and communicate with anyone that we um, mix with. And, and that is true, and, and I can definitely say that today. 
Um, but what I, I do know and what I can say is that um, to the teachers that are here today, know that we will stand and back you. And I, I, for um, Mr. Hardy, please know that uh, when you question what it is that these teachers, um, do they have the best interest of our students at heart? Even though they may not be able to locally say it to you personally, the fact that they are here and you can see the numbers and the community are here today, um, there is no question that their students' best interests are um, here and, and in their hearts and that they, they care because um, we all are uh, having the best interests of the kids in um, our minds so understand that and know and I just want to personally thank and I hope that Miss Vore is still here because she was one of my inspiration and heroes as long as uh, Coach Griff as well so if it wasn't for them I wouldn't be who I was today so thank you. I didn't really have enough time because I wrote a speech to save Mr. Hardy, and obviously he's not here. And <laughs> right before I left to come here, because I left my job to come here, I had read that Mr. Hardy changed his statement about the students reapplying, and not the students, the teachers reapplying for their jobs. So I decided to change my topic to the students in this community because I feel like he doesn't listen to us. Anymore. So <coughs> Mr. Hardy, if you see this video, please take what I say to heart because this is what Brian means to us. Recent events drew me to think about the day our basketball pep, of the day of our basketball pep rally. That day, one case, one question came to my mind: Where's Hardy? This made me think back to the number of times I've actually seen you at the school or at a school event. I couldn't think of more than two times. This lack of attendance to the events that define our schools <coughs> drew me to beg the question of why isn't the general student body is not allowed to say what we think the school needs and how it can be improved. A lot of the kids here see you as an outsider to the school. We want you to see the Lorraine High that we see. We can easily tell you what needs improvement, but it starts with you showing us that you care about the school that we love. So I ask you one thing, come spend time with us. Learn our culture, our beliefs. Learn what it means to be a Titan. Then ask us what we need from the school for, from the school for us to be better. We want to help make this school a better place, but it's up to you to ask us instead of putting all the pressure on our teachers. Jada Morales, I am a senior here at Lorraine High and currently enrolled in CCP courses. I went to Garfield Elementary from kindergarten to fourth grade, then I transferred to a private school. From Garfield to the private school is very different. Being in a private school, they made me conform to someone that I was not. The atmosphere was almost always down and a slight, slight negative. Not only was I not thrilled to go to school, teachers were not interactive with students and it was almost as if uh, inclusiveness was not included in the lesson plans. After eighth grade at the private school, I transferred back to Lorraine City Schools. As a freshman, it wasn't so much as a culture shock as it was a realization of what public education has to offer versus a private or charter school. The interaction between teachers and students was something that I was not used to. The willingness of teachers to help in any possible way, the dedication of their job to their job, and most of all, their ability to understand the culture in Lorraine. Never once was I denied educational help inside or outside of the classroom. I can say for 100% certainty that the academic help I received helped myself and my peers to the point in our education that we are at today. Ms. Sue Pileski helped me countless days in class and after class, sometimes after school. Mr. Steve Coffin has been in Lorraine his whole life. He knows the students and where they are from. When you incorporate that personal aspect into a teaching career, it leaves you with something you cannot teach. Miss Stacy Vore. I'm sure she needs no introduction, but for those of you who do not know her, she's one of the most amazing, uh, most amazing teachers I have ever had. From the first day of school, her outgoingness and courageousness is contagious. Her smile, laugh, and whole demeanor combined with her being upfront and honest, telling her students that her childhood was not the best, gives her the ability to relate to students on a personal level. 
She can look a student in the eyes and actually mean, I know what you were going through. Because of that, the possibilities of her helping students in class and outside of class are endless. You cannot hire individuals that possess experience like hers. You cannot learn her skills in a million years. Her skills and experience are deeply rooted. These are just three of the teachers that impacted my high school experience, and there are many more. Now I am a senior that will not only graduate with a high school diploma, but also with an associate's degree from Lorain County Community College. I can say with 100% certainty, I owe my success in the high school to the teachers at Lorain High School. Thank you to Mrs. Stacy Vohr, Mr. Steve Carlton, Mrs. Sue Poleski, Mr. Dave Maisie, Mr. Dominic Bernal, Mr. Terry Trout, Mr. Joseph Bach, and anyone else that I forgot. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Caitlin Mamie Rowland, and I am currently a senior at Lorraine High School. When I reflect back at my time in Lorraine City Schools, I can be nothing but grateful. I am open enrolled to Lorraine. I looked forward to becoming a Titan since I was little. Since kindergarten, I have been exactly where I want to be. Lorraine is my home. My time in Lorraine has been a dream. Starting in elementary school, I attended Lakeview and then Admiral King Elementary. I was a part of the Montessori program. This program is what set me up for success for the rest <coughs> of my educational career. And for that, I want to thank Ms. Bruce and Ms. Rio. From Montessori, I qualified for the gifted program. One of the best things that happened to me, from Camp Cuyahoga and our Davis dollars to creating a board game about our favorite animal, we were challenged to our fullest potential. Thank you to Ms. George and Ms. Davis. When moving on to middle school, I was nervous because I didn't see how middle school could get any better than elementary school. Well, I was wrong. <laughs> from day one, I was welcomed by an amazing principal an amazing counselor. It didn't stop there. I was lucky enough to get to participate in the gifted program once again, where all my core classes were gifted and I was challenged. Our counselor was always there to put a smile on your face or slip a positive message in your locker when you need it. In eighth grade, I was lucky enough to participate in two amazing experiences. One was the inaugural year of the Lorraine Bex Robotics team that you saw earlier today where we would work five days a week until the janitors kicked us out. <laughs> we worked very hard and qualified for states our first year, even winning the Autonomous Skills Challenge. Since then, the team out of five years has made states every year and qualified for Worlds twice, hopefully for a third this year. The other opportunity was the eighth grade trip where we got to go to Philadelphia, New York, and Washington, D.C. So thank you for the experience. For these experiences, I thank Mr. Nailitz, Mr. Dickinson, Ms. Hansen, Ms. Will, Ms. Miller, and Ms. Ali. <coughs> After my experience in middle school, I definitely did not think it could have gotten any better, but it did. Freshman year, I had 45 kids in my science class, but that didn't phase Mr. Fike. <laughs> he kept us all attentive and found creative ways to teach us in such a large class. We also had the opportunity to plan a dinner party where Stalin, Hitler, and other world leaders were in attendance. This, is, this was thanks to Ms. Dorsey's creative teaching strategies. Sophomore year, I was blessed to meet the teachers that would have such a large impact on my life. From staying after school every day for tutoring or always being there when you needed to talk, that continued during my junior year when a teacher spent countless hours tutoring me in trigonometry and helping me pre prepare for my ACT. I learned a new language, chemistry, and all about politics and government, where I began to form my own opinions on very adult issues. Finally, my senior year. While not over, there has been nothing but amazing opportunities. Starting my first day, I was very nervous to go to my first class on the L actual LCC campus. Ms. Haney and Mr. Killian met me at the college campus to walk me to class and introduce me to my um, professor the first day. S to sending me reminders that, is, that it is getting late and my assignment is due, so stop procrastinating. My teachers have been there to support me. You see, the thing about teachers that, is that everything they do, they do not always get recognized. They don't do these things to be recognized. 
or to be shown on social media. They walk with us on senior night when we have no one else to walk with us. They show up to our ACT banquets and never miss a school event. They are always there for us and understand us. We are a family, the Titan family. Because of this, I want to publicly thank Ms. Hall, Mr. Fike, Ms. Dorsey, and Ms. Wright, Mr. Donnelly, Ms. Pileski, Mr. Cawthon, Ms. Garwell, and Ms. Smith, Mr. Dahl, Dr. Boo, Mr. Maisie, Mr. Civic, Mr. Bernal, Mr. Marty, and of course, Ms. Ward. For all that you have done and continue to do every day to make a difference for us and the lives of our students. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Thayer. I'm a uh, former resident of the city of Lorraine, current resident of the county still. And I stand up here tonight as a 20 plus year union member, as well as a 15 plus year political and labor activist in the community. And I can tell you that, um, you know, from the, the trades where I come from, I can stand here and say I'm personally proud of, of all of our men and women, brothers and sisters, who helped build this school. If it wasn't for this community, if it wasn't for the students, if it wasn't for the folks sitting at this table and beyond, labor wouldn't have had an opportunity to help construct this school and be a part of the process of improving all of the schools in the community, first and foremost. Uh, secondly, you know, that, that thank you, if you will, we have to return that, and I'll, I stand here all day long uh, thanking the union members. I believe there's seven bargaining units in the city schools here, and I thank you all, because I know that your backs are up against the wall, and again, you don't, as it's been stated, don't get the recognition that you all so much deserve day in and day out. And to have an outsider come in from out of the community is no different than some of the things that we complain about with construction sites, where we want to take care of the folks in our own backyard. We have folks here willing to work, willing to uh, teach. They're willing to care. They care about not only their own kids, but all of our kids. That's, that's why they're in this school system. That being said, um, I'm not sending this message on behalf of any particular organization, but I've been involved in communications where there is going to be a meeting this Saturday morning that's going to involve labor, it's going to involve community leaders, I believe uh, political leaders, elected officials, this Saturday morning, 10 a.m., Knights of Columbus on Oberlin Avenue. Uh, we're trying to put this thing together because we all care. And bottom line, whether my kids are in a different school district and I don't live in the city anymore, it's about all these kids. Because at one point in time, down the road, all of us aren't going to be here. The leaders at this table, the leaders in labor, the leaders in community, we need them to be properly educated and taught not just the schoolwork but life's lessons because they have to take this over from us. So that's what, that's what this is about. We have to support them. We need to get together and put a plan together to help this out. Thank you. My name is Alexis Hayden. I've taught in Lorraine for 22 years. I'm currently teaching fifth grade, and I coach here at the high school, and I want to offer a different perspective. Um, I have a unique perspective. I teach and I coach, so I have little kids, and I have high school kids that I deal with. And I also serve many roles within the teachers' union. One of the roles that I have, I coordinate clothe a child efforts. So I get to know a lot of high school students. And I want to piggyback on what Stacy Vore said and what Coach McFarland said about the good kids that we have and the things that our kids in Lorraine do and the comments that a lot of kids make to me in the capacity of doing that clothe the child because I spend a lot of time with them. And where they get a lot of their ethics from, and it comes from the teachers that we have here at the high school. So I want to make that known, but I also want to say one thing, that my class at Jacinto is the only class and the first class in Ohio to have been chosen to do the Grateful People's um, Gratitude Journal Project. And my kids are very unique in the fact that they are very perceptive. And they are constantly looking at teachers and they are constantly watching faces. And they are always looking and they're saying, are you guys okay? 
And today I put a question up on the board and that question was, what are you grateful for? Because every day they write about <coughs> grateful, whether it's a list, because that's what the project is about. And today I put, what are you grateful for? The things that you are grateful for about Lorraine City Schools. And the first child that finished today kept bugging me to read it. And I said, I'll read it, I'll read it after school. I said, before I go to practice, I promise you I will read it. And he bugged me so much that I brought it with me. And if you will, it's written from a fifth grader's perspective. And this is the only thought that I'm gonna leave you with. The best, excuse me, I have eye problems too, so bear with me. The best thing I'm grateful for in Lorraine City Schools is the teachers and the stuff they teach us. They might push you to the limit that you get mad, but it is for your own good. Okay, yeah, it's kind of funny, but it's, this is his own words. Okay, they want us to get better. That is why I love the Lorraine City School District. That is from a fifth grader, from a fifth grader's perspective, who is watching everything that is going on. He wants us to know that, a fifth grader. Okay, now my point in reading that is this they know what we do as teachers, they know that we care for them. And if kids know that we care, they're gonna do everything that we want them to do. And what Ms. Vore said, the blame, please stop putting it on us because our kids know that we care. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tammy Rivera. I have a son that is in special ed here at Lorraine High School. And I don't believe if it wasn't for his special ed teachers, Mrs. Smith, and Mrs. C and the rest of his other curriculum teachers that he would have been a successful student in the school. My son has also had a few issues here at the school with um, bullying and I think that would need to be addressed at another situation but he has done really great here at Lorraine High School. He'll be graduating this year and from the nursing staff all the way up to all of his teachers, I give them the greatest prompts that I could think of because he has come a long way with the special education. And I just want to say thank you to all the teachers at Lorraine High School. Thank you. Hello, my name is Kyle Zett. I am a senior here at Lorraine High. And I want to take a second and I want to just give a round of applause for everybody in here. I am so happy for the support that's going on in here. Everybody gets it. Everybody understands the problem. And let me just set these down. All right. I I come to school every day in hopes of learning. I come to school every day in hopes of getting up in a career later on in life. And I have nobody to thank besides the teachers that I have. Every single one of my teachers pushes me. Every single day, they encourage me to do what I do. They are the reason I am going on to a four-year college. Everybody in this section right here, their teachers are the reason they're going on to a four-year college. Nobody, we have nobody to thank but our teachers and our families for our support. We students have been shut out for so long by the administration here that it's unbelievable. The teachers are here because they love us, but the administration here is, is here because they just want the money and they want the title. It, it's unacceptable. Like the transparency between Hardy and the students, last time I saw him was maybe like two seconds in the hallway three weeks ago. Did he say hi to anybody? Nope, he sat there on the corner on his phone. <laughs> no. How is, how is that leadership? Explain to me how you're for the students, but you don't care to interact with anybody. Don't sit here and the core, the, let me restart that. The core values, we, one of them is collaborate with integrity. And he pushed that on us for the first week of school oh, collaborate, collaborate, do this with each other, blah, 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 do that, do that. But what's he doing? How, Chase, how many times has he, did he say collaborate? 
Now, imagine that on a grander scale. Every single day, since the beginning of the year, has he collaborated with anybody? Has he spoke to anybody in a positive tone? Probably not, because he, oh, because he doesn't talk to anybody. He doesn't care. He's here for the paycheck. But he's sitting here preaching to collaborate with each other. The only thing he's collaborating with is his paycheck. I said that. I'm going to restate it. So, Hardy, I know you can't hear me and I know you're not watching. Stop preaching what you don't believe in. Good evening. My name is Jeff Godwin. Um, I'm not a teacher here. I'm a parent. I've had four children going through the Lorraine school system, and uh, we've been very happy with this. Um, every time we've come in to meet with the teachers, they've been able to enhance the curriculum when we've asked them to, which is something we couldn't get at other schools. The level of empathy that we see from these teachers is just incredible, and the, their ability to teach is the best. And I don't understand where suddenly this year, you know, I've been, I've had our kids in this district for the last 11 years, and every single building I used to be welcome at, and suddenly this year. I'm not welcome, <coughs> you know, because I volunteered at every single school, at every single thing, and suddenly this year, nope, walking in here is like walking into a penitentiary. It's like, it's weird. And, and when I try to talk to the people in the office, you can tell they're not real excited. <laughs> and and you, you try to joke with them or whatever, but you can't get anything. So it's, it's kind of sad, but you can tell it's uh, the product of what's going on. It's obvious that we need to change it and get back to where we were. So I just wanted to tell you that all the teachers, the administrators in the past, they've been really great, and we really want to get back to the way it was. Thank you. Hi. Um my name is Christian Nieves, and I'm a junior here at LHS. I've been in Lorraine City Schools my whole life, and I've grown to no teachers, no students, and just grow with them through kindergarten all the way to my junior year now. Ever since sophomore year of high school, I've noticed there's a trend. Every school year, it changes. Nothing's the same. The rules change, administrators change, and just the, like, just the environment changes altogether. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, whenever I come back to school, I'm always asking myself, what's gonna change this year? And there's never an answer because they always wait till last minute. The beginning of this school year was kind of confusing for me. During the summer, as you all heard, about the school dress code. We weren't sure what we could wear. We weren't sure what we couldn't wear. And it was very last minute. And I don't think that's okay because some parents struggle to get their children uniform. And last minute is kind of hard. And then those students who do not have uniform get sent to ISA. Another concern of mine <laughs> is that when students come in late, they, get, they sit in the cafeteria and do nothing. Or when a student is leaving another class and they have to stop to their locker and get through those thousands of students in five minutes, all the way across from A building to C building, how do you expect our students to get through that and get to class on time and be prepared? It's nearly impossible and we struggle every day to get to school on time and to get to class. Other students have told me that they don't want to come to school. The reason why is because What's the point of sitting in ISA? Because you have a dress code, you can't afford the school dress code, and also because you, um, I'm sorry. Uh, also because 
They're just sitting in the ISA when they're late to class, not even a whole minute. They could be in class learning something valuable, but instead they're sitting in the ISA, again, doing nothing. Another topic that I feel I have to address is our arts. I have nothing against the sports, and I support all of our sports teams and programs, but our arts programs are struggling. We're running a production, Mamma Mia, and we're struggling to find props and to get costumes because it, the money's coming out of our own pockets because we do not have enough budget in order to get everything that we need for the production to make it amazing. Also, it's kind of hard when you're in school and you're walking down the hallway, you're depressed, and nobody cares about it. You sit in class doing nothing, no effort, and the teacher's asking what's wrong and what's wrong, and you try to explain to them, and they try to help as much as they can, but the administrators are putting no effort in to care for our students. All they want is good grades so their projects can get raised. They don't care about how we feel and how we're struggling and how we deal with mental issues. And that's all I have. I hope you can come. Everybody. My name is Emma Henderson Wilson. I am 18 years old. I'm a senior here at Lorraine High, and I just have one thing to say. So I just want to recognize a few teachers that have really dedicated like their time and their patience and things like that into my life, which is Mr. Kreshenko and Sturgill, Dr. not Dr. Sturgill, Mr. Sturgill. And that's because at the age of 17, I became a certified welder and a certified universal technician. People look at me and they're like, that's like, that doesn't even match up because I get my nails done, and I get, <laughs> you know, wear lip gloss. But my teachers, they like gave me support and they told me I could do it. And my favorite thing is proving people wrong because like, what more satisfaction do you get other than proving people wrong? <laughs> and that's just all I want to say. And also another thing, I've been going here for all four years of high school and I've only been dress coded once and I was in 10th grade. And if you are gonna, if you're gonna um, enforce your dress code 180 percent, then don't enforce it at all right. because there's definitely favoritism in the school, and that needs to change. You either get rid of the dress code or you enforce it 180 percent. Um, my name is Harley McQuaid, and originally <coughs> I wasn't planning to speak today, but seeing how much the teachers care and how much the community cares, I felt like it was my civic duty to stand here today and to tell you my story. My father works at Ford Lima plant, which is two and a half hours away. So it is very difficult for me to come to school and to get the proper education and food and everything I need. Recently, my car had trouble with its power steering. I could barely drive it, but I kept coming. I know how important my education is to me. And okay. Three, three teachers offered me help and money and guidance to help me get my car fixed. And because of them, I am here today and I'm able to learn and speak in front of you. And I just want everybody to know that these teachers care more than you can ever possibly imagine. That's all I have to say. Um, my name is Marco Rivera, and I'm a, I'm a senior here at Lorraine High School. Um, I just came up here to say that uh, you, you heard from my mom earlier. Uh, I, I was... I was pretty lost when I first came to Lorraine High. I was under the assumption that everybody was just gonna treat me like crap and I wasn't gonna fit in anywhere and that I was never gonna ever fit in and I was gonna live the rest of my life here as a shut out from the rest of the school. Um, I was surprised, honestly, to find that there were so many people willing to 
help me give their time to improve my my uh, my academics, my self esteem, everything. Uh, I came from I came from uh, I wouldn't call it mental issues. I was I would call it like behavior issues, and I wasn't the I wasn't in the best shape when I first came here, but a uh, uh, couple of teachers pulled me aside and talked to me, and really got me, really got me uh, into the spirit of um, Lorraine High and taught me everything I needed to know about keeping calm and getting into the rhythm of everything here. Um, now in my senior year, I have to thank them a lot to Miss Smith and Miss C. They they are they're big in that, and um, I told I told them just today that I never wanted to leave the room because this is where I'm comfortable at, and th that's true, uh, not just in their room but in this school in general. Grand right High seems like uh, this bad place that ever that you read about on the news or that you see kids fighting at, but uh, as an example for me. Uh, clearly not every kid in this room, not every kid in this school is like that. And uh, if I had to say one thing for Mr. Hardy, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call him out of his name. I wouldn't do anything like that. I just, I just ask that, that you uh, pay attention to the, to the bigger things than the smaller things. There are more important things than giving out wristbands to kids that didn't dress right or that that couldn't that didn't come in on time or anything like that. Um, we have F's in our tests that need to be taken care of. 